Hello and welcome to the March edition of Made in Lincoln UK 2016. This is a social interactive documentary video magazine reflecting and promoting Lincoln District life and events. This is Saxon House. Uh, I'm Jude Jones and my husband Steve Jones and I started building this, oh, probably 20 odd years ago. It took longer than it would have done had we been real Saxons, but we were, were both working full time. We built it according to all the research that was current at the time, which was very little, about how Saxon buildings were constructed. It's built of oak and ash and some aspen. Um, the upright timbers are all oak, they're all earth fast, the, uh, the A-frame's built out of ash, and the two long walls are wattle and daub. Two shorter walls are overlapping oak timbers, and then the whole thing is covered in daub, which is basically a mixture of clay and lime and, and um, chopped horse hair and so on. We've tried to make it as accurate to the period from roughly the 7th century through to um, the 10th, 11th century. Styles change very little then. Um, everything in here is authentic as it can be, bearing in mind that buildings at the time, that there's very little left of them. And we've also worked on the principle that if the materials were available in this area and the principles and the tools were available, then chances were they were doing the same things that we've discovered. Um, we have people coming to visit, families, individuals, history enthusiasts, some filmmakers, some authors have been here. And currently we have a school that comes, a school for uh, children with special educational needs who come here and use the whole site for all sorts of activities, outdoor activities, events, history, science, even photography, art, English and so on and they come twice a week and enjoy both the building and the site. Now at the moment we've got a campaign on the go. Sadly thatch doesn't last forever and although our thatcher says it's done very well for the last few years, um, it is starting to deteriorate as we all do in our old age. Um, and particularly the ridge is showing holes through it. It's not wired over like a modern thatch to keep vermin out because that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but we've um, We've looked at it and realised that if the thatch goes, basically the building will go, it will disintegrate. We need the thatch, it is the protection. So we're trying to raise £3,000 to have the thatch done. Um, so we've got a Kickstarter campaign on the go. Kickstarter is one of these crowdfunding enterprises. Um, if anybody is interested, all the details about it are also on our website, which has recently been uh, revamped. Uh, so www.saxonhouse.co.uk tells you all the information about the building, how it was done, about Saxons in Lincolnshire um, and about the wildlife that lives here as well. And on there there is a link to the Kickstarter for anybody who feels enthusiastic about history, about local history um, or just likes this sort of craft project. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming to tonight's uh, meeting of the Socialist Party in Lincolnshire um, to discuss um, the devastating um, and brutal cuts that are being proposed um, by both Lincolnshire County Council but also all of the district councils uh, in Lincolnshire as well um, over the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, and the topic for tonight's discussion um, is how, um, we, how can we stop uh, council cuts because we don't think it's 
uh, enough just to um, sort of uh, wring our hands and say this is absolutely appalling what um, the government's doing. We want to um, discuss tonight a strategy and tactics um, to actually say that not only are we opposed to these cuts that will de devastate um, our communities but also that there is an alternative um, and um, how we can fight for that alternative as well. So um, I want to um, start by sort of um, painting a bit of a picture. Obviously, you know, we've had um, the current um, government in for, you know, less than a year um, and in, you know, uh, the, the autumn, um, George Osborne proposed um, massive, massive cuts as part of his uh, comprehensive spending review um, that would impact on local authorities because they would have the portion of their funding, the majority of their funding, um, that comes from central government, um, massively cut. Um, but also that he proposed as well um, changes in the way that uh, different councils uh, are funded, um, depending on whether they're rural councils, urban councils, and so on. Um, and actually, um, these cuts um, are really um, affecting some of um, the Tory heartlands, if you like. The, the rural areas that um, you know rely on um, public services because um, of their sort of uh, dispersed uh, nature and so on. Um, and what we're seeing in Lincolnshire is, is you know, a whole raft of um, different um, cuts being proposed. There's um, you know several millions of pounds being um, cut from bus subsidies. Um, there's uh, you know cuts being proposed for our fire services. Um, cuts that are being proposed for um, supporting uh, older people and disabled people um, and as the Socialist Party um, we believe that these um, cuts are wrong, that these cuts need to be stopped and that these cuts need to be fought. But the purpose of tonight's meeting, as well as obviously to identify what's like, wrong about what's happening, is also to talk about how we can you know, change things and actually how we can build a movement to, um, to stop the cuts and actually explain that councils do have a choice. Um, now, obviously I've talked about, um, you know, some of the um, devastating cuts that are affecting Lincolnshire and all the district councils in Lincolnshire, um, but, you know, I don't think it's uh, fair to just uh, leave it there. I think it's um, also has to be said that these cuts are affecting every single local authority in the country um, and the reason why I think that it's important to highlight that is that it's not just um, a, about us being exclusive in Lincolnshire and saying you know we're hard done by and cut another council or another council's funding and so on and actually the, the way that we think that um, you know we can fight against uh, these council cuts is by looking at it at a national point of view um, linking up with other campaigners in other areas of the country um, and saying that there is an alternative. This government um, is um, you know, less than a year old and already it's on the offensive when it comes to um, the austerity programme that it's putting forward. It's seeking to make the poorest people in society, the most vulnerable people in society, pay a price for an economic crisis that we didn't cause and that we uh, had no uh, sort of influence over. The fact is that it's, it was the bankers back in 2007 and 2008 who got bailed out to the tune of tens of billions, hundreds of billions of pounds, who uh, uh, destroyed uh, the economy that caused a massive crisis that had a knock-on effect on you know the uh, money that's uh, coming in through the government through taxation and so on. Um, and yet. You know we're we're being the, uh, asked to uh, pay the price, and actually, you know, as socialists, we stand to fight for working class people rather than the interests of the one percent um, who the Tories uh, represent. Um, yeah, hello, I'm Elaine Smith. Um, I'm a socialist, and I'm a anti-austerity campaigner, and. Um, on Monday, uh, I chained myself to the uh, Lincoln County Council railings to protest against the cuts uh, because I feel that the cuts are most unfair and unnecessary and uh, they need uh, opposing. 
uh, and um, I wanted people to know that um, there, that uh, many people within Lincolnshire are wanting to build an opposition group against the cuts. You know, they're wanting to fight back against the cuts, and I. I what I was hoping to achieve as well was the fact that it's a you know a united force against the cuts. It's not just about a hierarchy of public services, one group saying, "Well, you know, we'll save the buses at the expense of the family centres." Uh, we we want these cuts are totally unnecessary. They are uh, they've been done through choice, uh, and uh, they come at a time when people within Lincolnshire are seen. Um, you know, a um, already experiencing um, attacks on uh, libraries, previous attacks on post office, you know, post offices, now buses, charges to older people's. Well, in, in relation to um, people that live in rural areas, obviously uh, there's going to be a major uh, impact on them um, and it's so short-sighted because it's going to, it's not going to allow people to get into uh, the city and spend money uh, it's going to cause further isolation and loneliness for many older person uh, they're saying that call connect is not going to be affected but it doesn't work over the week it doesn't work at the weekends or well, definitely not on a Sunday so that's not going to be put in place of any of the buses that are going to be uh, taken out um, they I think it it costs more than the bus service and uh, it will only it just calls it just comes if people make it known that they need the bus whereas you know the bus <laughs> it shouldn't it shouldn't uh, act you know the buses should be there, and people should know when they come in and that they're available. Uh, when they're available to use them. For uh, many older people that have no longer got their own uh, transport uh, and rely on public services, uh, and uh, Call Connect isn't a substitute for that. Uh, no, they're not cutting Call Connect, but they're not improving it either. Right. Well, what we're doing is we've, we, we've uh, got a stall uh, on Saturday uh, in the city centre uh, and I'm hoping to continue from where I left off, but the uh, Socialist Party will, will be there petitioning against the what's happening uh, in relation to the junior doctors and their contract and the student nurses. And from that, we're wanting to build a protest for the 19th of February when the full council meets to let them know that there's strong opposition to what they're doing. Uh, and I use the bus um, every day, uh, and I see how valuable the bus service is. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, this is a massive and damning indictment of the privatisation and deregulation of the bus services back in 1985 uh, when it was done by Thatcher. Haven't been hammered by the crisis that we've seen lately and that is the 1%. You know, the 1% have got richer. Uh, what is it on a world scale? 44 multi-billionaires have got as much wealth as half the entire world's population. Mm -hmm. And the same kind of inequality exists in, in, in Britain. So actually the money is there for public services. And it's a you know, researched fact that something like at least £120 billion a year goes uncollected in tax because rich individuals and big businesses like Google, for example, uh, and a lot of other companies as well, avoid pay paying tax. The Tories claim they got this small payment, I mean, it sounds like a lot of money to us, uh, from Google, but actually over 10 years, Google avoided paying £2 billion worth of tax. Now, if they got the money off those people, then they wouldn't need to make any cuts in public services at all. And that's what we're saying. These cuts are not necessary, and on a local level as well. It's true, the government has cut the money that goes to local councils, but we're saying if councils really want to resist that, and by the way, as far as complying with the law goes, even Tory councils are saying, you're cutting so much off councils that we can't even uh, guarantee maintaining our statutory minimum duties. 
and the, the law says councils have to provide because the money's been cut so much. So, in fact, um, if, if local councils seriously say they're against the cuts, then don't pass them on. And as uh, Nick was saying, there are things they can do. Councils have reserves, and some councils have um, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of pounds, sitting in the bank in reserves, which they can spend. They can also borrow money and other measures that they can take, which, OK, is not necessarily a permanent solution to the cuts the government have made to local councils, but at least can buy time, a year, two years, three years, so that it gives time for a council to build a campaign. How much better if a council was going to local people and saying, we won't cut your bus service, but if we don't cut your bus service, you need to support our campaign against the cuts to get the money back off the government. We won't sack you. We won't cut your uh, terms and conditions as a worker for the council. We won't close the children's centres. We won't do those things. We'll use our reserves, but you need to back us in a campaign to get the money off the, uh, off the government. That kind of approach could win, especially if councils around the country link up together on a national basis. It would cause a massive government crisis and the beginning of a real fight back. So the reason we're here tonight is because of the proposed cuts to fire and rescue. Now, I was going to go into like the national position a little bit, in terms of the cuts aren't just in Lincolnshire, they're across the whole fire service. Um, and they're significant. Now, there has been significant cuts to the fire service. There's been uh, 5,000 firefighter jobs gone, uh, 39 fire stations closed. And what this means is it's increased response times, essentially. Um, the fire just takes longer to get to your instant, your house fire, business fire, car crash, whatever it is. And it, it is, it's, it's, um, it's about basically taking from the public sector and giving to the private sector. So, you know, the public own all this, it's theirs, it's yours. Without going into the whole austerity thing, you'll be aware of the pensions campaign. We've been taking just action over our pensions, I think justifiably so. Uh, again, one of the problems with the, the, like the pension scheme to fire service, they want to make the cuts, but the private sector don't really want to touch public sector pensions or the liability of it. Now think about the Royal Mail, they, the pension scheme there, what they do with the pension scheme, they basically made that, you know, the, the kind of debt, if you like, from that uh, into public hands, freeing up the private sector to come and take, uh, you know, take the cream of it away. Now, if they could privatise the fire service, one of the things they need to do is break the pension scheme down, which is what they're trying to do. It isn't just about saving money. In fact, it's doubtful whether it will save any money because people will leave the scheme most likely because it's so expensive. So again, the, the pensions campaign does feed into the whole picture of the cuts. In particular, the two Lincoln ones, the two full-time 24-hour stations, the only two 24-hour, they want to potentially turn them into a model called Lincolnshire Crewing. And what that means is in the daytime, you've got full-time firefighters there at the station, it takes a minute to get out the door. That's our kind of rule, to get out the door and get to an incident. With this new system, and, and at night as well as it stands, with this new system they want to bring in, at night time, they're going to change it so the firefighters are essentially on call and they'll live nearby or in a specially made kind of pod, as we call it. And they have five minutes to respond. So that means going from one minute um, to turn out, to get the fire engine to go out the door, to five minutes. Um, so they can see, and the, the impact of that is, if you take longer to get there, not only does it put firefighters at more risk because the fires are more developed, it puts uh, the public at risk because minutes really do count and it's hard enough to get there in time often to make a real difference as it is but you're right on the cusp so it, make, it could make all the difference um, so that, that's a real downgrade they're also looking to cut firefighter posts and that, instead of five people on a fire appliance or fire engine they can have four people on the fire engine now it might not seem a, a big thing but we have certain rules and how we've got to operate and to, to perform our tasks essentially when we're green operators now especially the high rises uh, but not just high rises. If we've got only got four people, we have to wait for a second fire engine to turn up before we can commit to the building and start uh, effecting rescues. We've got to fight and try and put pressure on them to reconsider. Uh, I think we've had good publicity so far. You know, we've I've done an um, interview with uh, Lynx FM, with BBC Radio Lynx, and with Look North, uh, and it's been on. Um, the uh, online uh, Lincolnshire 
Echo and... Anyway, uh, I'm pleased that I think now it's a matter of building for the, uh, the march on the 31st and just getting as many people, like you were saying, to sign the petition. I don't really think we can publicise things anymore. Carl said it all. Um, Elaine, I hope you know that I personally, obviously I'm behind this, I was there on Saturday and you've got yeah. Lincoln Labour Party's um, full support, as you know, the um, county Labour group at are right behind the campaign and everything um, that you're doing. It's been a fantastic effort so far. Just a couple of things. My understanding, I know that we're building towards the number of petition signatures um, with the hope of having that debate in the full council. My understanding was that the county council actually changed their own rules because they were so upset with how the library's protest went that they actually changed it so that you now don't have to debate a petition on the floor of full mm -hmm. council. Just one thing. The second thing, I'm wondering, can of, I think online is really the way to be pushing this petition and getting the kind of number of signatures uh, that we need. I think just on the library's campaign, I think where, obviously there's a whole campaign that went on, I think when the county council really, really, really lost any kind of shred of public support was when it came out that they had this gigantic underspend. So I wonder if there is more that we can make of the huge underspend that they have. And what is it? Kind of, we're talking 40 48 million. 48, 48 million. 48 million. Yeah. And Under the amount of money, the 1.23 million, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. That you, you know, so let's put those two figures together and you know, make, make the put that stuff out there. My name's Dan Taylor. I'm the Brigade Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union in Lincolnshire. Uh, we're holding a public meeting tonight to get across the message that the Lincoln County Council have got to save £1.23 million pounds, um, in the fire service and they're doing that by cutting the frontline service, um, by downgrading 24-hour stations in Lincoln, uh, also reducing crews from five to four, limiting the uh, abilities of those crews to make rescues um, and also cutting uh, managerial posts which provide safety at incidents. These cuts are dangerous to firefighters, but more importantly, they are dangerous to the public, unsafe, uh, and the public should know where their money is going. This exhibition is at the um, gallery at St Martin's in, in Lincoln and we've come to Lincoln because we normally exhibit in the East Midlands in Leicestershire and Derbyshire because we've been working with the National Forest for well almost 10 years now. They've supported our work. The National Forest, which is where we get most of our inspiration from, is a very fascinating area because it used to be an old industrial site, lots of old coal mines and so on, and, and now it's been, uh, been planted up with trees and so on. But I t I've been working on an old mining area which has got lots of layers of history in it, and I've got my inspiration from that. Uh, and of course this new walk that's going through the forest takes you through those areas as well and so it, it really becomes quite fascinating to work, to work there. Recently I had a large drawing exhibition at the University of Leicester and following that I wanted to get back into colour and um, I've done some recent um, textiles and these are two of them that actually um, reflect the colours that you see in the forest. 
really, in a way, I'm interested also in the shapes that you see and the textures and the linear quality that comes out in the vegetation that's there. Because in a way, it's such an inspiration for us that, that, that we have this opportunity to have a forest in our midst and for, so anybody can actually go and see it. And I hope that these textiles, with, with the kind of use of found fabrics and waste fabrics they all are, it all is made from, actually give people an inspiration to actually see it in a different light and actually probably consider other aspects of the forest than just wandering through it. I wanted them to see some of the detail that's present there so that in fact they look more carefully and, and actually perceive things in different ways than they might have done themselves. And this is the third piece of textile that I've just recently created. And you can see it's made up of lots of leaves that have fallen for the autumn. And this is called nearly winter. And there's just elements that are starting to show that it's winter leaves and the trans transition that goes from autumn into winter. And of course, although autumn is fantastic, winter in a way is as well, because I just love that decay and the idea of things breaking down and changing. And these two pieces are about decay, about winter time. And we often kind of hide away in the winter, but in fact to me the, the linear quality of the forest starts to emerge much more at that time. And these are just details of parts of the forest floor, which you, when you're travelling along this long distance path that the new forest have just created, you see the kind of detail and the, and the kind of actually fascinating textures that, are, that emerge. And these were pieces that um, uh, I, I, I finished my um, MA at the University of Lincoln in 2013 and these were help, I was helped to actually create some of these two when I was allowed to digitally um, print onto wool, wool fabric. And so these are digitally printed, but they actually are my original photographs that have been taken in the forest to allow me to show those elements of the, of the winter time. Hello, my name is uh, Graham Ensor. I'm a member of the G8 Artist exhibiting uh, at the uh, Gallery St Martins in Lincoln. Um, I'm a Leicestershire artist. Um, and we've been working with uh, the National Forest actually for um, oh, about 10 years now. Well this image is um, based on the pollen grain images I first uh, got from Derby University. Um, so I've in effect been um, playing around with um, the systems and patterns from those, uh, how they work together to create my own um, pollen grains as such, so, so they're all inspired by the pollen grains. So these are actually uh, etchings to begin with which have been changed and drawn into and bits of other materials added to them. So this um, sculpture was uh, one of the first that I started to play around with, um, again based on the pollen grains. Um, um, a lot of my sculpture in the past has been using found objects and actually changing those objects. So, so this one actually is, uh, is um, small uh, bits of textile from the craft shop. Um, there's actually a dog toy involved in it. Uh, and uh, I collect various boxes which I use as plinths. And the plinths become part of the sculpture itself as well. This, this sculpture uh, follows the same theme. Again, uh, in, in effect inventing my own pollen grains and, and so on by... Um, stacking them and using found objects. Uh, again, um, it's, it's another toy from uh, a shop, um, plus a, um, a sphere found from a charity shop, and also some debris from around the sites that we've been visiting. So this is uh, near one of the mining sites and some of the debris left over from that. Yeah. Following the same theme, it's um, another pollen grain creation, um, using um, all sorts of found objects, um, I tend to collect things from um, DIY shops as well, things from um, um, the um, shops, things like hair scrunchies uh, and so on. And they all sit in my studio in lots of boxes. So it's a bit like my palette of colours, my palette of objects, which I then grab and so on. Um, it's sitting on a pedestal, again, a found piece from one of the sites in the National Forest. Uh, so this is the fourth sculpture um, along this row underneath the prints. Um, it's uh, one that's um, again mainly recycled materials. Um, there's uh, uh, playing around making a pedestal out of objects found on the sites within the National Forest that used to be um, uh, agricultural or, um, or they used to be 
from the um, uh, old mining site to the open cast sites. This is the largest sculpture in the show uh, this time. Uh, this one has evolved since the last time it was shown as well. Um, there are different objects trapped within there which have a reference to things to do with uh, DNA and genetic material trapped within the pollen forms. Um, there are also some found objects in there from the National Forest and there are also references in it to a much wider area uh, in the world around us, the systems and patterns within the world around us and how they evolved. So I'm quite interested in uh, astronomy for instance, so there are references to those very earliest systems and patterns within the solar system. Uh, this, this one is um, again a pot that was found in a, a charity shop which I've, um, I've then changed uh, and, it's, uh, and it's evolved into one of my pollen shaped sculptures. Uh, sits on a piece of textile. The base is made from um, a piece of um, really old oak from one of the fences in the National Forest. So it's a very ancient piece which again I've worked into um, using an angle grinder actually to draw with. So I've been drawing the shapes on that with an angle grinder. This one's um, a group of objects. Uh, I often tend to group things together uh, in, a, in a way in the sense that the pollen tends to uh, group itself together and, uh, and end up in all sorts of corners of things. So um, lots of found objects again put together from a, a shop. The base on this one is actually um, discs from a, a really old hard drive on a computer. So I quite like the idea that that's a a base made of lots and lots of information, digital information, which connects with the science and technology side of what I'm looking at. So this one again is on a, a, um, a base which contains objects this time. I quite like using um, pedestals that have, you can put objects into uh, that become part of the sculpture. Um, again, lots of references to things to do with science, astronomy, and in particular the pollen grains again. Um, and it's made up of uh, little pieces and that I pick up from pound shops, uh, from um, things that you, you'd uh, use to um, put in your hair, hair scrunches and things like that. So uh, they're meant to be quite fun as well and jolly, um, but they have the serious side of, uh, of uh, being inspired by um, things to do with evolution. Uh, another one incorporating uh, a pedestal with a, a pollen grain inspired sculpture on the top. Um, another object from one of the pound shops. Um, toys incorporated in their parts of light fittings, um, even some seeds actually from the forest incorporated into them. Um, I tend to reference things to do with the geology in the area, so the pedestal was, was made using plaster and layering things, so like strata within the landscape and so on. Um, they also have references of things to do with craft, I quite like to question things within the uh, art, what, the, the, the sort of crossover between craft, fine art and the decorative arts and, um, and the meanings that some of those things can have. So this is an object referring again to the pollen but um, this, this time um, it's uh, got some parts that were actually found on one of the roads within the National Forest, part of somebody's suspension from a car um, and also um, part of an old washing up brush as well in there. But um, I quite like the fact that uh, they can be fun objects and um, at first sight they're, they're a, a sculpture but then when you get close to them you suddenly realise that it's, it's part of an everyday object which, um, which, is, which can be quite amusing. So um, Robert's work also has a, another aspect where he tries to uh, think about the landscape from a, a different point of view, uh, the idea that it can be uh, microscopic or macroscopic. Uh, so some of the things are quite ambiguous in many ways, so you have to make your own mind up. That can imitate trees, it can imitate rock, it can imitate the strata within the landscape. His colours are influenced by the landscape in his travels. Well, there we go. That wraps it up for this edition. Now, remember, this is your video platform. If you have any ideas or topics or issues that you feel would be of interest to the people throughout the Lincoln District, then get in touch with me and I'll put it in the big picture.